welcome to this review of my Keychron Q6 keyboard. This was a donation from Keychron themselves along with this Q1 Pro which I'll be covering in a later video. Originally it came with Gatron Brown switches but I swapped them over for those cream clicky switches from Novel Keys because A those are much more interesting and B the stock switches are a bit easy to make mistakes with if you don't accurately hit only the intended key. So this seemed like a good opportunity for a nice twofer. Besides I think people would get pretty tired of me doing yet another it's not tactile rant. I picked this keyboard by popular choice. I ran a poll on Twitter about which Keychron you guys wanted me to review, as several Keychron models have been heavily requested so far. The Q series was the clear winner, and me being me, I picked the biggest model in that range, which is this full size Q6. But they also have other form factors available. In fact, Keychron have a huge keyboard catalogue, and the Q series alone includes form factors ranging from 40% and even just loose numpads to full size plus ergo and split and even left hand models so you're really spoiled for choice but I went with this one although I kind of regret not asking for a numpad as well now that thing looks tasty as fuck and has macro buttons too this Q6 is actually a bit of a standout to begin with, as although multiple companies do these CNC'd aluminium keyboards nowadays, very few of them produce full-size keyboards like this, so this is a pretty nice USP if you ask me, all the more reason why I like this one. Now, it's not just the amount of different cues, but the amount of different series they have that's quite overwhelming, I think. At first, I had no idea what the differences were, but thankfully they were kind enough to help me out at this point. I'll explain the differences here for you, as well as leaving myself a mental note. Yes, I leave notes for myself in my videos, my memory is worse than that of a goldfish, so it's useful to do things like that occasionally. The K-series is the most basic and probably the most well-known of the lot as well. They're high-profile keyboards with RGB, ABS keycaps, Mac or Windows, wired or wireless, etc. Basically, a standard model. The Q-series is the same, except it's more like a custom keyboard, so it's got a double gasket CNC aluminium chassis with QMK and VIA support, it's hot swappable, has PBT keycaps, etc., all of which the K-series doesn't have. Think of it as the Enthusiast series. It is wired only though. Then there's the V series which is the same as Q except it's cheaper because it doesn't have the CNC aluminium double gasket chassis and the S series which is the same as Q but low profile instead. So the Q series is basically the flagship product now, although I guess the Q Pro series is going to take that place eventually. That basically includes wireless support and Keychron rather than Gateron switches, but is otherwise much the same. Anyway, it definitely has the price of a flagship product, as they range from 140 for a 40% to $175 for this full size, which is a remarkably small price gap for so much more keyboard. The numpad is $100 and the Ergon models are are slightly more expensive at $165 to $215. Overall they have pretty similar costs though and they're not cheap. That said, it is cheap for a custom keyboard, which is basically what this is trying to emulate. Things like the aluminium CNC chassis, double gasket design, along with the QMK slash VIA programmability, plus the wide range of colors and keycaps, etc. They're all very typical for custom keyboards, so that's clearly what they're aiming for, except they're using mass production to bring custom keyboards on the market at a more affordable price. It's not the first time I've seen this idea. The GMMK Pro, for example, had a very similar philosophy. So has it worked? Well, in a word, yes. It's built heavy like a brick shithouse, weighs more than a Model M, it feels as tight as a drum, has great sound dampening, I know a lot of you like that for some reason, and it handles very well. The weight is 2.4 kilos, or in Imperial units. <laughs> So it's definitely got some heft. The keycaps are great, they look good, they have a nice interesting shape and they come with a very fine texture as well. And this knob here, which is an option by the way, is pretty good too, if a little bit stiff and not in the customary location. But that's because of these four keys here, so I can forgive that. Volume knobs in general are very useful anyway. One thing I found them especially useful for is that you can pause YouTube videos that are on in the background if you're playing games without having to alt-tab and potentially fuck up your game. Neat little side benefit that. 
Anyway, about those four keys, they're macro keys that you can program, which is very nice. Dedicated macro keys, even if just a few, are just great to have. They can really make a lot of things much easier. Why exactly they've gone with PlayStation icons, I don't know. I thought the whole point of a keyboard was that it's physically and morally superior to a controller in every way, and controllers and all the godless heathens that use them should be purged from this earth, but hey, that's what they went with, I guess. Now, as for the programming, it's done with QMK, but thank fucking god, it's also VIA compatible straight out of the box. So, unlike the Repro Model F I reviewed a while ago, where I needed to use QMK first to be able to set it up for VIA, and unlike the Hyper 7, which was too old to be compatible, this you can just use directly. And that's massive, because QMK is the actual Antichrist, and if you're just a normal person and not a mega nerd that's been using QMK for years and does pro programming for a living and whatnot, having to use QMK for even a little bit is a total nightmare, but VIA is actually usable for real people too. I'll show you, you just go to useVIA.app, let it connect to your keyboard, and you just put in the changes you want. You don't even need to save and apply, let alone flash to fucking firmware or whatever, it just works immediately. The only thing you need to save is if you define a macro but just rebinding keys works straight away. I'll show you how to program one of the macro keys, let's say that one, and let's say we use macro 9, which is not in use yet. So we go to macro, go to that key, select M9, then we need to define M9, we go to macros, M9, let's say testing, stop, save, and that's it. Now it's already programmed, I mean, that's great. <laughs> I found out after the fact that Keychron even have a video on how to do this, although I can't seem to be able to switch the sound on, which is kind of useless, but anyway, it's a nice gesture, a mandatory one even, I'd say, because without some instructions, even the notion of what are QMK and VIA and why you should completely ignore the former and never use it in a million years are going to be a total mystery to the uninitiated. Of course, the best thing in my opinion would be onboard programmability without any need for external software, or at least the option of onboard programmability. Just press the program key, put that on some useless position like the insert, then press that with whatever key you want to program, input your string, and then press that key again, bam, you're done. Very nice, that would have been perfect, but if you are gonna go the external route, I think VI is not bad. It's come a pretty long way by this point. Now for the switches, which strictly speaking have exactly fuck all to do with this keyboard, but which I really want to review anyway, like I said, they're Novel Keys' new cream clicky switches, because they're not cream coloured, but whatever. In any case, they use a circular plate spring to generate tactility, as well as a clicky sound, and the switches come with a spring-loaded pusher in the plunger to provide for over-travel, among others. I did a teardown video on them, so if you're interested in how they work, have a gander at that one. So one of the things I noticed while I was playing with loose switches was that the switch has extreme mechanical hysteresis in the clicky department. It's not until the plunger gets way back up, basically all the way at the top, that the clicker resets, although the contacts themselves aren't plagued by this. Now, I thought this was going to be an issue, but actually in practice I didn't even notice, so that seems to be fine actually. Now, in terms of key feel and sound, I'm quite happy with this actually. The spring-loaded pusher inside of the plunger means that the tactile event is all but entirely disconnected from your fingers as you're pushing it. So these switches feel almost entirely linear, but they're still clicky, which is a very rare combination indeed. The weighting is a bit on the stiff side, especially considering they feel so linear. Personally, I'd lighten them a bit, but it's not too stiff to be unusable. And the sound man, I think it's this chassis that really brings out the good in them, but it's a damn good combination, I can tell you that. Listen to this. I usually really like Novel Keys' stuff because it's exactly that, actually novel, not just generic MX clone crap like 99% of all modern switches are, and sometimes you can get stuff that really works. Now, if you want an actually tactile clicky switch, this is clearly not it, but for a nearly linear clicky switch, this really works. They're just under a dollar a switch, about $32 per 36, which is 
Not cheap, but not the most expensive I've ever seen, especially from Novel Key, so it's an interesting and, in my opinion, very valid choice, as it scratches such a specific itch and it does it well to boot. Anyway, I've put a link in the description below, just like for the keyboard itself, so you can check them out if you're interested. That's it for this review. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.